Hello and welcome to Neutron One. I'm Jack. And I'm Stuart. And welcome to this third and final, as promised, advanced video on Neutron Quantum Speaker, where we're going to go through some slightly less traditional things, show you some of the unlimited creative possibilities that lie within this pack due to some of the things that we've included, talk about two key things, one of them being phase, uh, the other being um, stereo, um, both in terms of using the sounds to create stereo and also recreating stereo from some of the microphone positions that we have, a real stereo as it was recorded, uh, from some of the mic positions that we've included in the pack. So first of all, we'll just talk about phase. Um, you may have heard the word phase used in combination with microphones and recording and speakers. And quite often, more traditionally, it's associated with the notion that you want perfect phase, you want everything to be in phase all the time. And whilst that certainly is true uh, when you're trying to reproduce something uh, accurately and you don't want it to have anything weird happen when you start using it later in your recordings, there is, especially in the world of recorded guitar, a special place for not quite in phase, uh, not totally out of phase either, as I'll explain in a second, you don't want that ever, but um, Slightly out of phase can cause some very interesting sounds, and we're going to demonstrate that uh, when we go through some of the mic positioning that's in the pack in a second. But let me quickly just give you let me give you a quick visual just, aid. I've just come up with a name, Mojo Zone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the Mojo Zone. We're going to talk about Mojo Zone. <laughs> so phase. Let me talk about phase. So very, very simple concept in the world of, of um, phase alignment. If something is in phase with another sound, if you have two sounds, they are effectively sound waves. Now, in a most simple way, you can represent a wave, think of it like a sine wave, like the picture here on the screen. It's called a wave because it looks, funnily enough, kind of like a wave on the sea, right? The bit above the sea line you see, but uh, the bit underneath is still, it's still there, you just can't see it. But we're talking here in terms of um, sine waves, which is a kind of nice, smooth, uh, wave that goes above and below the center line here. So if another sound is in phase with this blue wave, then it will line up either perfectly or partially. And if it lines up perfectly, the net result of that is that you add the two together and you end up with a resulting sound that is twice as loud. So if you were to say you have two identical copies of a track, say, on your DAW, yeah. and you played them both at the same time, they would be identical and in phase. And in that case, what you would hear at that time when you played them both together is the exact same thing, but twice as loud. Like, like everyone must have doubled a track. Yeah. Yeah. Simple enough concept. Now, if that sound was to be perfectly out of phase, so let's say that you took those same two tracks and you hit the phase reverse button on one of them, on your DAW, now you're going to have your waves doing the opposite to each other. And what the net result of that will be is a flat line, or in other words, nothing at all. And you will hear nothing. When you have two sounds that are perfectly out of phase, the net result of that, what you hear, is absolutely nothing. We are going to demonstrate that in a uh, practical application in a bit as well. But just a primer there to, to understand what phase is. Now, obviously, these waves could be not perfectly in or out. And what will happen then is you will start seeing changes, not, not absolutely nothing or absolutely everything times two, but changes to the frequencies. Some frequencies may be attenuated, which will sound like a very strange kind of EQ, sometimes called comb filtering, which is like a kind of uh, very notchy sounding EQ type of thing where it will, certain frequencies will be cut away, sometimes by quite a lot. Um, and so it's an interesting sound and it's actually probably, to a lot of people who listen to a lot of recorded guitar, quite a familiar sound because m when you put microphones, lots of microphones in the same physical space around the same object, if you're not perfectly aligning the phase of those, and there are calculations you can do to do that, um, which is really a topic for your professional audio engineer, but just suffice to say that if your phase is not perfect, then to a certain extent that comb filtering will occur. 
And as a result of that, there are many recordings of guitars that aren't perfectly phase managed. Uh, and so those have over time become quite familiar sounds to people. Uh, and we'll demonstrate again that in a second when I start putting slightly out of phase microphones in the picture on purpose to show how they cause that effect. But that's a primer. Um, basically, it's the interaction of two sound waves, how they uh, combine to either create positive or negative phase reinforcement, uh, either all or only some of the frequencies that are occurring. So hopefully that will help to make sense when I start talking about phase. So here we go. We've got a little test project where we're going to start looking at some of these more advanced concepts. But I'm just going to calibrate your ears very briefly with a simple single microphone, completely in phase, just on its own. It's a mono, mono microphone feed. Um, feeding it this um, Neutron Superplexi profile, which is something I've been working on for a little while. It's a kind of uh, idealized version of the Plexi sound, which combines some of the things that I learned when making the, uh, the Van Halen pack. Some very interesting things. Um, a slightly more modern take on the Plexi sound, uh, but made with a real Plexi, just feeding it slightly different signals and capturing slightly different um, audio from the power amp stage, and then being able to manipulate it slightly to create a kind of like new version of that sound. Um, so that's what you're going to hear. I'm just going to calibrate, as I say, your ears with this just briefly on its own. It's just one single microphone. It's dynamic one from the pack. And just, just be thinking with these things as well, like you're, you're departing that motion now of going online and buying equipment and something that somebody else has set up. And they think it sounds good in that place. Think you're now walking into a studio. Ah, yes. And... Indeed. And, and you're not just walking into a cool studio. You're walking into a studio with an engineer that knows where to put those microphones for it to sound great. I think there'll be some people that will obviously have really great knowledge and they'll know some of these things. But for others, this is, I think, going to be a new way that you're going to look at recording your guitars or creating sounds. Um, so you're not in a shop buying some kit. The kit is there already. It's been set up expertly and if you need to change it there's an expert there too yeah you're going to get a lot more choice here than you would on one of my yeah. recording sessions that's for sure yeah yeah that's you wouldn't get you 20 <laughs> 27 microphones set up on yeah, yeah. on your guitar cabinet for every session but yeah. uh yeah no it's a it's a great it's a great way of looking at it think of this pack like you're in the studio uh you've got a professional engineer they are properly micing everything up managing all the phase for you and putting everything in the right place and recording it with the correct levels and calibrating all of that stuff. And you're then sat in front of the mixing console. And, you know, you're the, you're the artist, you're the musician, and you're listening to those mic feeds coming back in and you're deciding which ones you like the sound of, turning them up and down. Maybe the engineer will go through ways that you can combine them, which is, so let, let us be the engineer for you now and do that part. And when you think about how this pack could work for you, how you would use it, imagine yourself, as I say, as the artist with all of that work having been done and you being presented then with those professional mic feeds on the desk for you to then choose the ones that you like and blend together. But we're going to explain maybe some concepts and techniques for doing that, for combining things that you may have not seen before. Or maybe you've heard them before, but not understood what they were. Uh, hopefully this will open your eyes to some real, like infinite creative possibilities. Um, and we'll go through them sort of one thing at a time. But so we're starting with the with the, just a the basic sound. This, this is the amp sound that we're going to use to play through all of the speaker uh, combinations so that you've got a, a kind of bass line. So, oh, the guitar we're using today, uh, Washburn, Steve Stevens. There's a Steve Stevens theme tonight, uh, as you'll see later on. Uh, but yeah, fantastic kind of um, old school, I guess, Charvel style, solid rock machine. Everything flat on the body, pickups screwed straight in. It's, uh, I think it's based on one of his really old Charvels that he uh, has used, I think, on almost every famous recording. Right. Yeah, you, yeah. Know, you know how the artists have, they do an endorsement deal the with what? a company. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's the one they play when they're in front of a camera or on stage or whatever. But when they go in the studio, they open up the box yeah. and they bring out Old Faithful. 
So I think this is this is based on his one of those uh, it's an old Shava. I believe it had some sort of glow in the dark paint job as well. It's quite cool looking thing, but white. Anyway, there we go. So that's the guitar, and um, here's the sound. <laughs> Super lovely, plexi sound. Love that kind of stuff, but uh, really apt because what we're dealing with here, of course, is Greenback. So these are the original partners of the plexi. Yeah. Greenback, well, there was a 65 watt Celestian that was around for a little while, but it kind of very quickly became 25 watt Greenbacks with a kind of with a de facto speaker partner for a 100 watt plexi uh, in a 4x12. So good partnership natural sound for you to just evaluate all the changes we're making with the microphones because let's remember the only thing changing here is the mics because the speaker is the same speaker mm -hmm. the amp will be the same amp throughout the examples so the position of the microphones is the only thing changing some pretty wacky stuff's going to go on here uh, based solely on mic positions and, and combinations so i'm going to start just with a simple concept because there's there's this interesting thing about a neural amp model that i've seen people talking about and that's that it isn't stereo, and that's somehow limiting or a problem for the possibilities that you can you can get from it. Now, I could understand maybe if you're like a keyboard player, yeah. and your sound source is stereo, and you want to yeah. be able to run it in stereo through the plugin. But a guitar is mono, right? Unless you've got one of those old stereo Gibson ones. Yeah, I know they exist, but I mean, basically, an electric guitar is a mono instrument. So. Um, for this example, it doesn't really make a lot of difference having a stereo plug-in, but what does make a huge difference, and what is fundamentally transformational about not just Neural Amp Modeler, but any of these kind of products that are plug-in based, is you can run more than one at the same time. So now when we talk about the possibilities of stereo, well, you know, if you want, if you want stereo, so in our example here with our, our dynamic one in the center, we can do some very simple things to create an interesting stereo version of that sound, like taking the same microphone. So in this case, uh, the dynamic one on the cap. And why don't we combine that then with the exact same thing, but off axis. So this is pointing, if you remember from our little talk on on and off axis positions, on axis points directly at the thing it's pointing at, so the cap in this case, the dust cap in the center of the speaker. Off axis is going to point at exactly the same thing, but at a 45 degree angle. Um, but it's pointing at the same spot. But that does change the sound because the high pressure sound waves, they pass the front of the microphone's diaphragm instead of going straight in. So it tends to slightly reduce the high frequency content. And when you combine it, with an on axis sound, if I was to do that in, in mono now, which I'll do, we are talking about combining stuff. Um, the two together, you'll notice there's a lot of similarity in the frequencies uh, and the way that you'll notice that, should make perfect sense after our little primer, is it's gonna get a lot louder when I turn the second one on. So this represents a lot of the same phase going on with these two mics. Mojo. So there we go, there's just one of them. Now I'm gonna turn the other one on, which is the off-axis one. Almost twice as loud, but not quite. And what's interesting here is if you wanna know what's going on with the phase and the cancellation and not, if I reverse the phase of one of these now, yeah. what you're gonna, this is what's called a null test. What you're gonna hear is only the things that are different between these two. And what did I say about the high frequencies passing by yeah, yeah, yeah. the diaphragm on the off axis yeah, mic? Yeah. Okay, so there we go. That's, That's what's, what's different left. between yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so what's this left. is so this is not a theoretical thing. Well, I mean, I mean, describing it for you in yeah. in scientific terms, but I mean, this is one way that you can absolutely not in the audio way visualize exactly what's different. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not turning anything up or down. I'm that reversing the so, phase. So and cool. if, I, if I play you this same microphone, and if no one's ever tried, if some, one of you haven't tried this before, this might seem 
weird, but... So this all fax is mic. If I reverse the phase of it, well, it's on its own, nothing else playing. It doesn't sound any different. It needs the interaction. Yeah. Phase being reversed doesn't change the sound unless it has something else for that interaction yeah. to actually change. So, much as when you hear them combined, it gets a lot louder. Yeah. The opposite of that is what's left. So, um, it's so cool to like, even as a like a technique to understand what yeah. you're not capturing. It's very useful. That That's you want, super. want to compare two things and find out what's different about them, assuming that they are. I wouldn't you know, have thought. Yeah, how, how else could you do it? The source is the same, so yeah, yeah, you're yeah, actually yeah. able to compare things in that way. So what we're going to do oh. with this, we've done the combining in the last video, and we're combining mics and stuff to get a different sound. But what I'm going to do with this is use that subtle difference between these two things. And it, and it is quite subtle. Look, listen to them. That's the on axis. And that's the off axis. Right? They don't sound massively different. But if you then take those two sounds and pan them left and right, yeah. then you're going to get a little bit of interesting stereo movement. Yeah. And because these are nonlinear profiles, they're not static like an impulse response. They're not always doing the same, same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. And the microphone's getting different information because yeah. it's pointing in a different right. direction. Yeah, yeah. So they're not always going to be 100% the same. So would that make it off axis, but in the other direction? No, what it means is because it's off axis, it's getting fed different yeah, okay, information yeah. from the speaker. But then, okay, yeah. So it's reacting it could, because it's a nonlinear system. That's a nonlinear transducer, and so is the speaker. When you start feeding loud uh, sound pressure levels into a nonlinear device, Different frequencies will make it react in different ways. And that's yeah. key because well, they are getting different frequencies. They're not in the same position. One yeah. is in a different one. So when there are higher frequencies coming out of the speaker, higher notes or yeah. things that have got more high frequency content, the microphone that's hyper uh, sensitive to high frequency because it's on axis mm -hmm. is going to react differently to the one that isn't getting those because yeah. it's off the axis. Yeah. And what that means is you'll see very subtle movement in the stereo. Yeah. And that's really interesting, although it won't sound to your ear necessarily like, oh, you know, this is a, there are two different things happening, one on the left and one on the right. It's much more subtle than that, but it's really interesting. So that's the touches. That yeah, it's, it's more interesting than having just one single mono source. So <laughs> let me play some in, in the stereo and we'll sort of swap maybe back and forward between that and the mono one. <laughs> And now in mono again. And then stereo again. Interesting to listen to. Interestingly, it doesn't sound broad. These two microphones, they were panned hard left and right. Yeah. But you'll notice that the stereo does slight well, it allows, movements. It allows you to connect with the playing as a listener. It, it's, in a way. More, it's more interesting to yeah. the ear, right? Yeah. And if you're wearing headphones, then I'm sure you're going to get much more of a, of a picture of what's going on there. It is a centralized image because, again, you listen to the, the, the differences. When we did the phase null test, those are the only things that are going to be yeah. to your ears, left or right. Yeah. The rest of it's all going to be in the center anyway because it's phase coherent. So that means that you've got this really nice, just kind of high frequency movement going on, mm. which is really interesting to your ears. And, and if you've got a stereo field to play with and you have you know, guitars in that space, that movement, especially when you start doubling it and doing other things like that. Well, and you could you could bring this in at different parts of the track, right? Yeah. When you're going through later in the track to create interest as well, right? Yeah. And that doesn't stop with, with one idea. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah. obviously at this point, you could start putting as many of these microphones as you want in different places in the stereo sound field. Yeah. Uh, you don't even have to hard pan them left and right. You could have one in the center and one on the left. 
you know, and, and if it's a sound that you want to double, you could do that and then do the same well, it's really with nice. another one and have one on the right well, as well. It's nice as well, depending on where your other instruments and stuff yeah. are and the vocals sitting in. So the principle being, because we're running a plugin, it's not a piece of hardware. You can have as many instances of that plugin as you want. Uh, and if you can't run them all at the same time live because your PC or Mac isn't powerful enough, then you have the freeze option in it, every major DAW, which means that that's a non-issue anyway. Like if you, if you want to free up some processing time, you, you can freeze your track. It's exactly the same principle in all the major DAWs. Uh, you just have to go look in your instruction manual on how you do it. But once you've got the sound that you like, obviously you can't play it live with it frozen. You have to record something first. But if you record a track, so let's do that. I'll show you how this works. Easy way to uh, demonstrate the idea. If I record now. <laughs> There you go, some load of junk. <laughs> if you now want to take one of these tracks and freeze it, which would free up the CPU so that you could use it for another one, you take your track. Uh, in the case of Reaper, it's here in the edit menu. You just freeze the track up to the last offline effect. It turns that into an audio file instead of trying to run it live in real time, and then turns the plugin off. So then you've got your CPU back. That's great. And you can still so hear the sound. Great. Yeah. So there's the sound frozen for you. And then if you need to change that for some reason, you've changed something going on, you can then unfreeze it. Uh, make your change to the plugin and freeze it again. Yeah, so there's no excuses here in terms of processing power. You could run a hundred of these, mm. freeze them as you go, you know, when you start creating as long as you've got, uh, which is one of the reasons why we included the quick start files. If you just want something to play through, mm. you know, to record the part, and then you can go in and after that start creating your complex sound, then those you could just run the single profile. It's going to sound like a kind of nice basic balance blend. Capture your performance. And yeah, record your performance and then come in and, and start getting going to town, getting your really interesting special sound that you want. So there we go. It's one example of stereo. Obviously, you can take any one of these mics, add it like we did in the previous example video, uh, add your mics together to combine them, but also, you know, combine that with use of stereo using the pan controls and, you know, even you know, slightly different mic positions on the left and the right are quite a nice thing to do. If you don't want it to sound like two different sounds yeah. and you just want to create something interesting, then that's a really great way to do that. And of course, because it's a plugin, you can have as many as you want. So that's the kind of basic idea of stereo through panning. We have, we have another stereo topic to deal with, but we'll come back to it because first I want to look at phase. So we know that having things out of phase when you don't want them to be is pretty annoying because it can cause random things to happen that you can't control. Uh, and it means that you aren't then getting a true representation of what it was that you recorded. But with guitar, sometimes um, you want things to be out of phase because it sounds interesting and it really can sound so interesting that you get used to it after a while. Uh, and it's, everything sounds boring when you turn it off. So I'm gonna give you an example, leaving out our, our two stereo, uh, dynamics there that we had a second ago. We'll just leave them and build this on top. So here I've got a ribbon mic, ribbon two, and this is in the front position. So you may remember again from the, the primer video, the first one, that the front positions are away from the cabinet, not in the room, but one meter away. And one meter is an interesting distance in terms of phase because it's just far enough away to start causing phase issues. Yeah. Uh, but not far enough away to, totally to, to, to only contain room sound. So it's actually close enough that it still sounds quite like the thing, you know, right there in front of you. Um, I've aimed the microphone at the null spot on the cabinet, which is the, between the speakers. If you imagine a four by 12 cabinet, there's this point in the middle where there's no speaker. Yeah. And if you aim it there, particularly when you're using wide polar pattern mics, it sort of picks up everything. Yeah. And it therefore works well if you have close position microphones that are on different speakers, which these are. So in the case of our pack, all of the dynamic microphones are on one specific speaker, the one that I thought sounded nicest with them. 
but then all of the condenser microphones will be on, the, the profiles will be on another speaker. Yeah, yeah. So if you combine those, as is very common, then you're going to have the two different cones, mm. which is, you, you do that because it's nice. It's diff the differences are interesting and, and nice to have. So anyway, we're talking about phase here. So I'm going to do a little uh, experiment with you now. I'm going to play you this sound uh, that we just created with the stereo uh, left and right dynamics. And I'm going to bring in a microphone that is in this front position. As I said, it's the um, ribbon, ribbon two, ribbon mic, one meter away from the front of the cabinet. And listen to what happens to the sound when I turn it on. This should hopefully illustrate for you what not quite totally out of phase sounds yeah. like. So this is a partial out of phase situation. So here's just the stereo thing again. And here comes a little phase toy. Ready? think you like it but when you go back <laughs> well i mean turn it off Where have you got interesting on? isn't it so to illustrate that this is not completely out of phase two things that you can do well firstly you can hear it so you know it's not completely out of phase um but yeah fair enough we've got two other mics that we're actually playing this against so it could be that it was out with one if I phase reverse this now, though, you can see that it is reversed at the moment, but certainly because I preferred it this way around. Uh, but if I phase reverse it, you're going to see that it will do the opposite to what it's doing now. So slightly out of phase, we said some frequencies would be um, filtered. Yep. You'd get an effect where it wouldn't, like, it's not going to work like a high or low pass filter necessarily. It's going to be a bit more random than that. So some of the frequencies are being turned down, some of them are being turned up. Some of them are not being affected at all. The overall result of it is something quite unnatural and quite interesting. If I reverse the phase, though, it's going to do the opposite thing to what it's doing now. So. Now, this is a really important thing to talk about. Because these are not impulse responses and they are non-linear, this is not EQ. What you're hearing here is not two EQ curves combined as they would be if it were two impulse responses. If that were the case, then you would start to hear some quite extreme peaks. It, knowing what we do about phase, when you combine two frequencies that are the same, and that's a constant, so it's linear, it's not changing over time or changing based on the input that you're feeding it, then you are getting a flat boost in a certain frequency due to that phase, yep. either cancellation or reinforcement. So that isn't happening here because this is nonlinear. So you've got each of these individual microphones responding to the incoming frequencies in its own way. And when you combine them, it's not a simple mathematical X plus Y equals Z mm. because everything that you're feeding it is causing a different reaction on each one. So it means that although we've got these big reinforcements in, in the high end on this sound, if I play high notes, you're not having these weird, like, spiky peaks in a frequency response like you would with an impulse response. And this is one of the things about IRs that has always frustrated me. That you can't use them like microphones. You can't just take a bunch of IRs and you know, and try and recreate what you would do on a real recording session, combine them, uh, because you're going to have what is then effective. I mean, IR is an EQ curve, yeah. right? It's an EQ curve made from whatever the speaker was doing when it was captured in terms of EQ only. There's no dynamic behavior, so there's no reaction from the speaker and the microphone to the frequencies that you're feeding into it. It's like it's kind of dumb in that way. It doesn't really care about what you're feeling. It does the same thing regardless. So when you take two impulse responses and combine them, you don't get the same as you would if you took two microphone feeds and yeah. combine them. It's lacking that innate ability to combine without causing uh, 
perfect phase reinforcement yeah. in the high frequencies or whatever EQ is being applied due to the comb filtering um, in, in the simple system that is an IR, you can create just a massive peak in an equalizer that would then have one really harsh sounding note or whatever. So because that isn't going on here and it is still all reacting in its non-linear way, the combined sound is evened out by that process, right? So just to give you some more examples, we'll, we'll just to kind of understand the possibilities here. And there are an extreme number of possibilities <laughs> available. Um, if we start with just this one example, okay? Two single uh, dynamic microphones combined with the front position. So the basic front position list here is, uh, there's, there's four of them because there's the two condenser mics and the two ribbon mics that have a front position. And that might initially seem like, oh, that's not very many. But I mean, we'll play some. Remember though, for each of those, you also have the out of phase version, which will do the opposite to what it's doing when it's in phase. So in phase with the condenser one. Okay, and then obviously, you know, condenser two, same thing again. And they're all different. They're all different because they're on slightly different orientations and they're different microphones so they have different frequency responses. We've got our two ribbons, which are figure eights. So again, they're going to have a very different picture of it. <laughs> Phase. Okay, uh, and then ribbon two. So that's just through the four positions. So we've we've immediately doubled them because we can have them both in and out of phase on their track, which makes them react mm. in one way or the other. <laughs> it's interesting about the um, that's a that's a room. I don't want that one. Yeah, I was like, that's very roomy. Uh, front is what we want. There we go. I, I mean, I'm imagining in my mind that that sound on that record was slightly out of phase and yeah, might, yeah, might yeah. be wrong. But look, there are loads of examples yeah. of guitars that were recorded and the phase wasn't perfect either intentionally or accidentally. But it's a, such a familiar sound to your ear and such a hard thing to understand if you don't understand these building blocks that, yeah. that make up the situation where things can get weird and out of phase. What you have though here with these front position mics, and this is where it really starts to open up, right? We've just gone through this combination of the four front positions with a single, single main mic source. All right, yeah, it's two of them, pan and stereo, but basically the same thing. It's, it's dynamic one on the center, right? Um, so you have that same eight possible uh, front positions then with all of the other mics that have a um, close position on the cabinet. So that works out. We were working this out earlier. It's crazy. I think that works at something like 128 possibles um, of just combinations of front position and close position of all the different mics. But then there's the other side of this, which is actually this is, this is not a on or off scenario. So by that, I mean, if you change the volume of your front position, let me now turn it down, right? So that's off. As you turn it up, you get more and more of the effect. And the same, of course, for each. So 
you can have exactly how much of this effect you want. And we worked out, okay, so if we were to just take a 12 dB range and have only full decibel increments, so let's say you can turn it down by one decibel down to minus 12, right? Even that would represent something like 200,000 possible combinations. Yeah. And that's based on you having only one original sound to combine the front with, one mic. Now, of course, there's nothing that says you can only have one mic as the main sound that you're going to combine front with. So when you start then getting into, you know, everything we covered in the last video, how you can combine mics to get a natural sound that you like, and then bring one of the front positions in at whatever level you like the sound of, in whichever, which of the two phase positions you like the sound of the most, to create that disturbance, that interest, um, I have no idea how you would even calculate. How many possibilities that is? is that... Zillibly, it's, in, it's infinite. It's infinite. It's infinite. But what's what the point of it is? It's not infinite in the sense that it's a folder it's full not, of yeah. infinite choice. It's something yeah. that you choose with your ears. You go, ah, oh, yeah, at that yeah, level. That's yeah. where it sounds good. And it's only one thing that you have to then turn up and down. So, you know, infinite choice without infinite dissection, without having to have infinite files that you have to audition. You're doing it in real time. You're turning the thing up and down. Mm. That's much more manageable for, for you as a human. You know, it's not, you aren't a machine who can look at a folder full of 100 files and go, ah, that's obviously the one I need for yeah, the yeah. sound that I want. Whereas this is a process of you're now selection. Able, you're now able to create the sound as opposed to select it. You're creating it, right? But being, being given the raw materials that are already good, already professionally captured, you're choosing between all things that are good already. But one of the tools that you've been given here is a phase disruptor, effectively. Which sounds awesome. Phase you know, disruptor. Yeah, I know. Right? Phase going to be that's definitely going to be on the next transfer. Yeah, I think we should have called it that. Phase I should have renamed transport. these microphone positions to that. But that's, I mean, that's basically what it is. It's an, it's a purposefully not perfectly in phase mic because, of course, all the others are because you want to be able to combine them all and end up with a predictable reproduction of the original mm. speaker. But sometimes you want it to get weird mm. and you want to experiment. And that's exactly what these are for. But rather than having all 200,000 possible combinations yeah. as impulse responses in a folder in the traditional way, you know, this is a different take on how you interact. And it's a perfect facsimile for how you would interact with these sounds if you were the artist in a studio yeah. with a professional producer and engineer. These are the things that they would be showing you and asking you to decide. Which ones do you like? And maybe there'd be guidance, just as we're doing here. Okay, so, so you know, we we're being that part of the equation, and then you you're being the artist and saying, well, look, that's the sound that I like. That's what I, that that reminds me of something that I like, or that's what my I hear in my head. You don't have to have a huge amount of individual building blocks in order to have a huge amount of choice. So, um, hopefully, that's interesting and something different that you've not seen. Certainly, I don't think you would have seen in, in an impulse response pack um, before. And it's kind of a part of this, this new approach, which is an old approach. It's like we're trying to do it now with this pack in the way that it was always done for real, with individual building blocks that are perfect reproductions of those real sounds. So like if you were an old school player who never dealt with digital stuff and you were to load up this, or if you were an audio engineer, maybe not even a guitar player, who records guitars often, yeah. you know, this is the kind of thing that would be perfectly, uh, you'd be perfectly at home with. It's like it's exactly what you would get if you were doing it in, in the real world. So um, I believe it's time for us to get back to that reality, not just in terms of trying to have a higher quality reproduction of the sounds so that they're being captured and represented to the, to the user sounding more like the real source, but actually the way that you're interacting with them I think it's, there's a huge benefit for trying to keep some consistency with the way that it's done in the real recording process yeah. and the way that it's being done outside of that. Because what you end up with then is a lot more commonality in your ability to reproduce those recorded sounds that you're used to hearing, yeah. which ultimately I think, you know, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think for a lot of players, those recorded sounds are their reference. Those are the things that they're trying to sound yeah. like. They want to start there at least and then maybe tweak so because of what we're doing with these building blocks, 
you know, you could maybe get exactly close enough to the same sound as something that you like on a record, but then you you can move and change individual elements of it. So if you want to then personalize that and make it different and unique, you're not having to go looking for another file. It's yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just oh well, I'm gonna yeah. I'm, I'm gonna turn this one up or I'm gonna change just that microphone in yeah. this in this setup, you know. So you know, hopefully that's that's exciting and new and something that people can get into as a concept. So, so that's the phase disruptor. Phase disruptor, love it. <laughs> for now, from now on, it will forever be known. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do now is show you a little bit about actual stereo because you know we can create stereo from lots of different microphones and that's all cool. Uh, but there is one thing in this equation that really actually is stereo, and that is the room. Yeah. Uh, and that's for simple reasons. If your room is well designed, then it will not be the same in all directions. When you place your sound source in the space, if you want it to sound interesting and nice, the last thing you want is four square walls equal distance apart. You know, with your sound source in the middle, it would be disastrous for the sound of the, of the end result. What you want is interest and difference. And ideally, good calibration of the space. And by that, I mean there's no individual frequencies that are um, disproportionately boosted through phase cancellation uh, or reinforcement boosted or cut uh, inside the actual physical space when you place an object in there and turn it up. So that, that means a calibrated room, something designed to be recorded in. So obviously, the room that these have been recorded in is a very well calibrated space because it's capturing early reflections that then are going to be present in the sound, no matter what reverb you put on it later or, you know, whatever. So it has to be good. And so this is a, a 3 dB calibrated space. Sounds, it sounds maybe like, uh, you know, an alien language, but what it basically means is that over the entire measurable frequency range, or let's just say from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, there's only up to a 3 dB variation in volume of any single frequency from low to high. So it basically means it doesn't affect the sound very much, which yeah. is exactly what you want. When you're trying to record a thing, the last thing you want to do is record a thing in a place that's changing how that thing sounds, yeah. because then you have to so. contend with those changes. So the basic principle here is a well-calibrated space to record in means a very true to the original source recording, which is, and when I say recording, we can, we can proxy profile for recording. You know, pro these profiles, each of them, treat it like it was a recording of a microphone in front of the camera. It's exactly the same. Um, so that's only important to know in that when we start talking about the room and its uh, uses in this case. Because your object is in a space, when it emanates from that space, imagine dropping a pebble in a pond. Mm -hmm. The waves, they go out in all directions, and sound is a wave. So that does exactly the same thing. A point source starts narrow and gradually gets wider in the space, and then it hits a wall. And it bounces off that wall, and it bounces off another wall, right? So as those movements happen, and the sound interacts with the space that it's in, it's going to bounce around and then collide. Frequencies will collide with each other. Yep. And that's where you start to see these kind of phase interactions going. But also, the room itself, the construction, the materials, how well they absorb sound. Maybe the sound will hit a surface, and it won't bounce off it like a laser pointer on a mirror bounce off and then shine equally bright, you know, on another surface, it will, maybe some of it will be absorbed by that surface and then that will change, but maybe not all of the sound, maybe just the high frequencies in the sound. Yeah. They're absorbed, now it bounces off sounding darker. So the complexities of the room and the fact that the, ideally the room shouldn't be perfectly symmetrical and your source shouldn't be perfectly in the center, it means that as it starts to bounce around, if you're standing in that room, you're gonna hear different things out of your left and right ear, yeah. okay? So this is where the stereo room idea comes into play if you want to perfectly reproduce that reality. So we can do a very simple thing in order to get that back. Even though these microphones are mono recordings, two of these microphones are figure eight mics. And what that means is they pick up sound from both sides. So if you have a diaphragm of a microphone, uh, and I'll illustrate it in this orientation just because it's easy for me to do, things that hit it from this side move the diaphragm this way. Things that hit it from this side move it the other way, yeah. right? And that's, that, that is phase in action, okay? Phase positive, phase negative. Phase positive, phase, and center, no sound in the middle. Has to be 
at one extreme or the other to be creating a sound. So if something hits it from this side and the microphone is in its natural phase, then it produces a sound. Yeah. Something hits it from this side and it's in its natural phase, it produces a sound. If you flip the phase round, what you end up with, I can't turn my hand all the way around yeah. without breaking it off, so I won't. <laughs> but if I thought it would be impressive, it would be impressive yeah, if I could. Yeah, <laughs> like exorcist. <laughs> um, if you flip the phase of that microphone, what you then end up with is the opposite scenario. So oh, things yeah. that were hitting it from this side, you're now hearing them as if they were hitting it from the other side. Or more accurately, you're hearing the inverse. Yeah. If you then pan those left and right, then you end up with what was hitting from one side on one on side of the side. speakers, what was hitting from the other side on the other, if you phase reverse them as well. So I'm going to do that now and play you a stereo room created from a single figure eight microphone. You can see um, what I've done in order to get that situation to occur is exactly what I've just explained. You have the same mic, same position. This is ribbon one. The room off axis, which means it's pointing at the side walls, not at the source. Times two, so the same exact microphone on two separate profiles, one panned left, one panned right. And if I then phase reverse one of them, the left speaker will contain what was hitting the diaphragm from that side, and the right speaker will contain what was hitting the diaphragm from this side. Kind of weird on its own, so let me turn this dynamic on as well. Just a mono one. In fact, you know what? Let's use our stereo. A stereo pit. Okay, so now you've got the original sound source with the room. I turn the room up a lot more than you would normally have, just so you can hear it. So that room is now stereo and it is perfectly reproducing mm. the stereo situation that would have been in that room yeah. when it was recorded. It's not, this is not making up anything, okay? This is captured from the source. Yeah. So if people think that um, you can't do stereo with a mono, a mono signal, that's not true. It's about understanding how. So there is one problem with this, uh, and this will lead us into the mic technique that we're going to use in order to actually implement this when we go ahead into combining these things into an actual usable musical sound. And the problem with it is, or should be obvious hopefully now, phase. So at the beginning we said if we combine two things that are perfectly out of phase but the same, then the end result will be nothing. So that's a problem because if you were to then listen to this in mono, which I'll just simulate here by panning them both back into the middle, what you're going to hear is... No. Nothing. <laughs> They've cancelled each other out. So that's a problem. What if your sound reproduction device is mono? Yeah. The room is going to disappear, and that's not ideal. Um, so there is a way. And this now brings us to the actual mic technique involved here. So what we're using here is what's called a blum line pair. And you will sometimes hear it referred to as a coincident pair. It's similar, but not quite the same as mid-side or M-S, which is another thing you may have seen in, um, in your adventures with audio plugins or, uh, you know, in professional audio, you may have heard the term mid-side. I probably won't have heard the, the Blumline pair term so often, but this is kind of like the ultimate version of this idea, okay? So what you do, to create your Blumline pair is you take, ideally, two microphones that are the same. You get their diaphragms as close as you possibly can together. Yeah. So ideally, if you were two microphones, you'd have them directly mm. opposing, right? you know, one above, one below the other, one turned upside down. So it's in as case. close as possible to the other one, not touching it. Uh, and you're going to point one of them in one axis of the room and the other in the other. Yeah. So one forwards and backwards and one left to right. Uh, and then when you combine those two, and you create this um, inverted phase scenario with the side walls, you then have a mono compatible version of the same thing. So if you then collapse this down, I'm going to play it in stereo with the front mic as well. 
So if we now collapse this all down into mono again, our front mic already is mono. Same sound, but in mono. So you don't now lose your room in the mono mix if you were going to listen to it through a mono device. In stereo. And in mono. It sounds a lot nicer in stereo, but I mean, you know, that's the idea, right? So this is the Blumline pair that we've been going on about. Extremely useful to get ultimate realism from your stereo space. When you start using these kind of stereo rooms as your ambience, your early reflections in the sound, yeah. which, you know, we've talked about. I mean, if you just want one great example of it, go and listen to any Queen record yeah. after Night at the Opera. And like they discovered ambience at the early reflections almost as loud as the main guitar tone mm. in almost everything that, that Brian May recorded after that point. Um, some great examples of it on, um, uh, there's a track that we were listening to earlier, what was it called? Uh, the Prize on uh, Kind of Magic, on the very beginning of that. It's not only huge ambience with stereo going on with the, the early reflections, but it's also got a, like a phase, a phase yeah, thing yeah, going yeah, on as well. So it's almost a, a perfect example of all the things that we've just talked about here. Go and listen to the beginning of that track. It's a, it's a tasty lick as well. Really nice. Uh, I think you had a bit of an Eddie Van Halen moment. Anyway, so that's really um, all we need to go through here other than for you to understand that, of course, you can do this with all of the mics that have these positions. So although the examples we've given here are using, you know, whatever it is, Ribbon 2 or Ribbon 1 for the... Um, for the example, that's, you know, in the pack, the positions are the things that you're interested in because then you can go in and start experimenting. Maybe you prefer the sound of the room yep. with the sound that you've chosen with Ribbon Mic 1. You don't have to do it using the Blumline pair either. You could do a mid-side if you wanted to, um, where you combine one of these out, uh, off-axis Ribbon Figure 8 sides with like a cardioid front. So you could take any of the room positions of the other mics and combine it with those. The only downside of that would be that when it's in mono, it won't sound identical. But you still have a room. Yeah. So there aren't any rules with this stuff, honestly. This is all about uh, what appeals to you, what makes you happy, what makes you inspired, right? But just be aware that phase always has something to play a role in when it comes to combining things. So when you start getting into the, the stereo stuff, always make sure that you check it in mono, either with a, a mono button on your you know, monitor device or just pan everything in just to check it out before you finalize any mixes that you do using these kind of techniques, just to make sure you haven't made a mistake and accidentally caused a phase cancellation where part of the sound like disappears in mono. For all we know, you know, someone could be on a on a mobile phone or, you know, I guess some of them still in mono, I don't know, but anything that has a mono speaker in it and suddenly all of the room is gone. Or even worse, maybe other things. So do check it in mono to reference to make sure that what you've done is is mono compatible. But other than that, have some fun really. Yeah. So um Go find some mojo and some voodoo. That's it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to we're going to give you an example of kind of all of this everything combined. I'm going to play through a track that has most every one of these techniques employed in the sound. Um, hopefully, we'll give you a good feel for how when it all comes together, the result is musical. Because, like you know, that is really the point. <laughs> I know there's there's it's a lot of fun toys and lots of choice and that kind of thing, and that's all there to make it creative and and infinitely variable. So. You don't come back and use the same IR, you know, the same thing that you used last time every time, and your guitar always sounds the same. There's really no reason why even the smallest changes to these wouldn't allow you to have a variation that fits better musically with that particular track that you're making on that day and have it be different every time. And have, I mean, look, what you're playing with here, the building blocks, there are 27 different things in this pack. Uh, one of them being the Neutron Sub, which is a pure bass reproduction device, not a microphone, really. It's a transducer. Uh, so 26 microphones, really. It's not a lot. It's not a lot of individual uh, things. And bearing in mind that, you know, 
you have three different microphone types. You've got your dynamic microphones, which is we've discussed, great for highly directional laser focus on one area. You've got your condenser microphones, which are broader again because they're picking up a, a kind of a bubble in front of them and not behind. And then you've got your ribbons, which are picking up in front and behind. Yeah. So hopefully you can see that those are logical choices to build this kit from. They, each of them has a purpose. You have two choices for two different types of sound. One of them will be very natural. The other one will be less natural, but perhaps iconic. Um, all of them have been chosen because they sound good on that speaker. And none of them have been specifically revealed in order for you not to be focused on what they are, not to be listening with your eyes, not to be looking at that name and going, oh, a Neumann U87 or U67 or whatever, you know, that must be the best one. That's the most expensive. That's the one I should use. Just try and just forget all of those things and, and trust that this has been made by people who know what they're doing. All the choices that we've made are viable. There's no bad choice in this pack. There's only choice. So you choose what you like the sound of and try to employ the techniques that we've described in these videos in order to, you know, and learn by, learn by experimentation. Get command of these tools, because if you do so, you'll be gaining the knowledge that would allow you to do this for real. In a real studio, in a real recording environment, these are the same things that you would be presented with. So having that knowledge is valuable. It's not just about learning how to use this specific piece of equipment and, you know, and then another one comes out and you learn that one. These are, these are real facsimiles for reality. And so, you know, applying a little bit of time to learn how to interact and use these tools is going to translate for you as a musician. Bearing in mind that you know what we're describing here is a is the the reality of recording music and how it's done normally. You know those skills are going to be valuable to you for a lifetime. So hopefully uh, you you, uh, you can spare the time to watch the videos and you know maybe do a bit of reading and a bit of experimentation and we know that you're going to get a lot back from that and that will be useful to you forever. I'm going to go and get in my jumpsuit because I feel it's time for a flyby.
we go. Your body's writing checks. Your body can't. Get, you're writing checks. Your body can't cash. <laughs> well, I, I just remember the line about flying rubber dogs Fly out, out of Hong Kong. Or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All classic. Harsh. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. So. Hopefully a good demonstration of all these different things all at once. How you can create a sense of scale, how you can make it sound big, how you can make it sound real, how you can place it in a space, how you can use the different microphones to get the right combination of clear and full. How to use stereo. We've got a stereo room in here. And, you know, I'll, I'll go through quickly what's on here. We don't need to break it down like we did the others, I don't think, but you should get the idea pretty fast um, about what's going on. So a couple of effects. Uh, I did cheat slightly here, I think, and use one of the effects that we put in the um, Van Halen pack, but hey-ho. There we go. Recycling. It's all good for the environment. So that was the preset from Beat It. There we go. With the Tal Chorus again, which is becoming fast, one of my faves. This is free. It's a free chorus plugin, and it's awesome. Go get it if you like chorus. Ain't nothing like it. Um, it's based on some old Roland synthesizers chorus unit. Juno 60, I think it might be. Uh, but in this position one, it's really, really close to the kind of micro shift, even tied pitch shifter thing that was used on loads of guitars in the 80s. It's very subtle. It's not like, you know, chorus, but it's, it's when you put position two on, and certainly when you turn them both on, it is, but this is really nice and subtle and great for that kind of effect. So um, there we go. So that's the only effects you're hearing. Bit of our uh, Van Halen thing and um, the Tal chorus doing its thing. It's a huge sound. Loads of early reflection. Very eighties. I've been in a stadium. Yeah, um, and obviously on its own sounds kind of ridiculous, but in the context of the track, it's a big production. There's lots going on. The guitar is the lead instrument, so like the vocal, I guess you could say, in this particular role. So it needs to have weight and scale and needs to deliver the musical message in a way that sounds like it's the authoritative sound, right? So um, it's playing the melody. So there we go. I mean, we've got... Uh, turn these effects off. Bit, a bit of everything here. Dynamic one on the cap, combined with an off phase, a phase disruptor. Phase disruptor. The condenser <laughs> one in the front position. Uh, but it's you can see the difference in level here. So this one's slightly louder, this one's slightly quieter, a combined difference of about 9 dB. So it's not just combined, it's tuned to the point where the combination is exactly what we want. Bit of the old Neutron sub for some of the low-end action. And uh, then the stereo room using the Blumline technique with Ribbon 2 as the front and the side mics. So there we go. Hopefully that example brings it all together for you in one place. You can hear how, you know, when you use these tools, and this is my kind of takeaway message. These are musical tools for making music. Yeah. Uh, again, we get caught up in the gear and we can get caught up in the toys and the choice and all the other stuff. But like the message at the end of the day should be, how is this going to make my music better? So because this is based on the way things were done for decades in the real professional world of recording music to make records to sell to people that they would enjoy listening to, we kind of know that these techniques are sound and that these tools are useful. So... In, in the sense that, you know, it might seem like a step backwards. Honestly, I, I'm going to see it the other way around. Like it's a step further towards having access to all the genuine, real um, proxy for the, the way things were done back in the day, having access to those in a convenient way now, that you can just load up a plugin on a track and have a real sounding situation, not just something that's convenient. You know, impulse responses are supremely convenient. But really, that's where the benefit, that's where the benefit ends. Mm. They don't sound real. They aren't capturing all of the behavior of the speaker. 
and you know the, the, they become very prevalent which makes it even harder because everybody's using them so at that point it almost becomes self-justifying where people don't want that to not be a good solution because it is the solution and you know we do need to kind of look at this as a kind of a slight shift in the technology and like all big changes in technology like color television when it came in there were loads of people who weren't interested because there wasn't any color stuff to watch and you know Eventually, though, it becomes obvious and normalised. And I think that we've seen the first signs that a lot of companies are looking beyond the IRs and trying to introduce new products that maybe try to simulate the nonlinear behaviour of a speaker, but algorithmically, so it's not, it's not captured at the source. It's not actually the same. Um, and that's great. You know what? So it's a great step towards where we need to go, which is for it to be absolutely real. So we figured, you know, we have these tools and we have this knowledge. It would be a great idea to try and turbocharge that process by just going straight to the absolutely real, complete proxy for reality in terms of the tooling as well. Uh, and just put that out there and hope that people can enjoy it and most importantly, make music with it and, and have that contribute to their creative process. Yeah, and if you're stuck in that mix, put it down, come and get the quantum speaker and start again. And for everyone that's uh, um, not necessarily a guitar player, or puts guitar into their music, or works with other guitar players. Or uses microphones. Part, part of a it. band. If you're in a band, set up a fun day. Get some tea and some cucumber sandwiches and go crazy. Um, so, so don't just think of it as something that, as with the IR responses, you're going to go out and you're going to play those in isolation. I think they're great for that. Um, this is going to allow you to go back into your musical past and more excitingly, even for me, um, it's going to make or allow me to make better music moving forward as well. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you're going to end up in the situation that the original artist would have been in. I think that this is misunderstood. Yeah. That a lot of people think that when they hear the sounds on records, like it's that they think of the artist yeah. solely. Yeah. And although they could well have been involved in the choices, yeah. they probably were involved in the choices, you know, that ended up with the sound being the way that it was. The person presenting them with those choices had a lot to do with it as well. They could only choose between the things they were presented with, right? So that's kind of what we want to be now in a world where there's much fewer opportunities for people to go to big studios, hire professional engineers, is to be able to bring still all of that world into a normal workflow in a digital world where maybe you're there working on your own or you have to record at home, you have access to that kind of stuff where there's no compromise in the sound. Yeah. And all that's required is for you to maybe do a little bit of watch a few videos, you know, learn some things that maybe you didn't know, or maybe remember some things that you used to know and haven't yeah. needed to do in a while because, yeah. you know, you're not recording in that way anymore and get back to the source in terms of, you know, working with those raw materials to create the magic. And, and that's absolutely what we have here. So this video, this third video represents the launch of Quantum Speaker for the Greenback. And we are in the works with um, more. So, you know, it's not going to be just this one. Uh, obviously, they take a long time to make these aren't <laughs> they're not a simple operation, but um, it's coming and obviously videos will come along with it to explain all that stuff as well for each one that comes out. And, and we just hope that, again, that you find these things to be useful musically, to make music and um, remember that that's, you know, is a musical instrument at the end of the yeah. day. Right? And the things that worked for decades making records the techniques and the sounds and the, you know, the microphones and all that stuff, they, they still work today. They just maybe aren't being presented to people in the same way because of changes in the kind of products that are being made. But, you know, we really hope that these things can be useful again. That's it from us. Till next time. Over and out. <laughs> Brilliant.